Yeah. Can you hear me clearly, right? Yeah, I can hear you. Professor, we'll be starting in a few minutes' time. We are, we are still waiting for everyone to join. All right, um, thank you. Just that. let me know when you're ready. Okay, ma'am. Sure. Um, Professor Seeger. Um, so, um, Mr. Amila Sandan Basnaika, who is the one who connected, uh, was contacted you, I think, ma'am. So, he's going to be a bit late because he's busy today. Uh, he has some work, so he'll be there around, at around 7 7 15. So, until he comes, we'll be continuing the session, madam, with just us. That's fine. So shall we get started? Yeah, sure. So uh, Professor, we'll be starting now. So hello everyone. It's 6.36 p.m. here in Sri Lanka. So good evening everyone. Welcome to SETS Space Talk with MIT, organized by SETS Karanir and SETS Sri Lanka. So first of all, I'll introduce myself. I'm Isuri Gunatilaka from Faculty of Science, University of Karanir. And with me today, I have two of my best friends, Harita Teladam from Faculty of Social Science of University of California, and Netni Sahajeva from Faculty of Science, University of Peradeniya. So uh, before starting the session today, we thought of telling our audience a little bit about what SEDS is and what SEDS Sri Lanka has done so far. So let's get started. Harita. Harita, your mic is muted. Audible now? Yeah, Harita. So, okay, thank you, Isuri. 
so what is sets that's a, a short for students for the exploration and development of space so in sets we promote space exploration and development through educational and engineering projects so sets earth is a collection of nations around the world and each operating under the same idea to promote the space industry so set sri lanka or in short sets sl is a part of these nations and established to promote space related knowledge among the sri lankan students so isuri over to you so thank you harith for the amazing introduction on set now as he said set sri lanka is here to promote space related knowledge among the sri lankan students so i'd like to talk a little bit about the projects set sri lanka has done so far So to start with, said Sri Lanka organized cube satellite development and ground station control workshop with Orion Space Nepal. They also organized an inter-school astro hackathon competition and acting space Colombo 2020 and international innovation contest. So some of you here might know about the NASA Space Lab Challenge, but did you know that said Sri Lanka was the local host? for NASA space up challenge in 2020 so as you can see said sri lanka has done an amazing job so far and they will surely continue to do so in the future by conducting interesting and insightful space talks and webinars in different field different fields of space science so coming back to today's session harita can you tell why today's session is really important to us Harita, you are muted once again. Okay. Uh, sorry for the issue. No worries. And so I hope you guys really are uh, exciting today about the sessions and. Uh, So why is today really important? Today we are going to talk about exoplanets. So it's a relatively new topic to all of us. And so what are exoplanets? Uh, what uh, what is their significance and how did they form? What are they made of and are they habitable? By the end of our session today, we are hoping to equip all of your audience uh, with exciting facts about. these exoplanets and we got just the right person to answer all your burning questions about the exoplanets so uh is sorry over to you for yes harita we indeed have the best person to talk about exoplanets but you know since we are having this virtual meeting i'd like to liven up the mood a bit so i'm going to take just one to two minutes to tell you a small story now this is a story about a little girl This little girl, she grew up in Canada, and she was a really special girl. One day, she went camping with her brother, and just like any other little kids of her age, she sneaked out out of a tent, and when everyone else was sleeping, you know what the first thing she did? The very first thing she did was to look up at the sky, and then she saw the starry sky. I like to think that that's the moment she fell in love with not just stars but also with the entire universe. There's no formal concentration of of there's no formal definition unfortunately. We have um some planets that are very close to the star and they're heated by their star. We have a lot of informal names like hot Jupiters. There's planets we call mini Neptunes because they're smaller than Neptune. There's some crazy names that are not very scientific like super puffs. which sounds like a kind of american cereal but super puffs are just planets that are very low density and very 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 puffy so i just wanted to share these as part of my introduction these posters on exoplanets nasa's uh, posters they're these kind of fake travel posters trying to imagine what the planets might be like kepler 186f where the grass is always redder on the other side experience the gravity of HD 4037G is super earth. This is a planet that's similar it's, that has a higher surface gravity than earth so they're imagining perhaps someday 
we probably can't go there, but if we could, we could um, imagine parachuting in a planet with a higher gravity. Relax on Kepler 16b, the land of two suns where your shadow always has company. Because there are planets with two suns, actually. These planets orbit around uh, two stars. There's always two sunsets. Two stars, yeah. We like to say that science fiction got some things right. Hopefully there are some uh, Star Wars fans out there. So that was um, my introduction. <clears throat> what is an exoplanet? Planet orbits the star other than the sun. Thousands of exoplanets are known to exist and nearly every star has a planetary system. <clears throat> Here's a very nice question. How are these planets named? Do the numbers mean any kind of order? Well, it turns out that there's not a very creative naming system for planets. <clears throat> it would be lovely if we could name planets after you, for example. You could name it after your SEDS chapter. <clears throat> but we have to follow a specific designation so the planet gets named after the star. Some stars have proper names, the brightest ones, mostly the ones the Greeks named, like we have Alpha Centauri. And so if there's a planet around Alpha Centauri, it will get a letter, B, C, D, E, F, G, in order of discovery. So there's a planet around a star 51 Peg. 51 Peg is a star in the constellation Pegasus. And when a planet was discovered around 51 Peg, it just got called 51 Peg B, lowercase b. And that's it. Now, sometimes there are planets, um, the planets aren't necessarily in order, like B, C, D, E, F, G, as you go away from the host star. They're named in order of discovery. So it can get quite confusing. Now, many stars were not are not visible to the naked eye, and they just have a catalog name. So a long time ago, a person named, um, actually, a person with a relative lot amount of money died. His name was Gleas. And his widow, his wife, decided to continue his work to get a star catalog made. And all the stars in that catalog have a name like Gleas 229. You know, it's just named in I don't know what order. Finally, some stars were never named. And then they can get a name by the mission that discovers them. So it's not a very satisfying answer. Once in a while, okay, one more thing that is relevant for you is that once in a while, there's a contest to name planets. And the contests are open to organizations. So as an individual, you can't do it, but your SEDS chapter could nominate, make um, a suggested name through the International Astronomical Union. And then they put it out to a vote for individual citizens all around the world. So if you pay attention to that, you may have a chance to name a planet, but the names really don't mean anything. And the letters don't mean any order either. So it's not a very good answer for a group of scientists, but that's where we're at. <clears throat> so the next question that I get asked very often is, when will we find another Earth? <clears throat> I think you know that we're not just here to find another Earth. We're just trying to understand the range of planets that are out there. But this question is very common. And so to do that, I'd like to just mention that an Earth itself is not one of the faintest objects in the galaxy. It's not necessary, or in the universe rather, that we try to observe. It's not necessarily fainter than the faintest galaxies ever observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. But the challenge is that our Earth is right next to, is that another Earth, just like ours, would be right next to a big, bright, massive star. And in fact, our Earth is 100 times smaller, 300,000 times less massive, and 10 billion times fainter than our sun. So if we want to find another Earth, we have to overcome these huge numbers. You know, what I love to ask my audiences, and I can only see about 20 of you at one time, and a lot of you, your videos off anyway, but those whose videos are on, I'm really curious about which, if you were going to embark on planet searches, which kind of method would you choose? Would you choose a method that involves planet size? That's one part in a in hundred, one part in 10,000. Would you choose a planet finding method that involves planet mass? Because then you have to measure the effect of the planet on the star to one part in 300,000. Like if you do a physics lab or you build anything at home or you're measuring anything with the ruler, how many decimal places do you go to? I bet you're not going to six decimal places. 
Now for, or perhaps you'd be very ambitious and you like doing really hard things. You would choose to observe the planet in reflected light, which is 10 billion times fainter than our star, our sun. Imagine measuring or attempting any kind of experiment that you have to be precise to 10 decimal places. Well, I'll be talking about a couple of these, but if you were to vote for the first one that you would do planet finding by the first method, then you would be along with um, probably a thousand people on earth who are using the method using planet size. And this method is called the transit technique. You can see on the top, there's a planet going in front of the star as seen from our viewpoint. And on the bottom, you can see the brightness. Okay, so we don't spatially resolve any stars like the one on the top, but on the bottom it's a, is what we measure, the brightness of stars as a function of time. So I'll play that one more time. Some of you already know this, some of you don't though. And what's amazing about this idea is that we don't, we just see a little tiny drop in brightness um, indicating a planet going in front of the star. And did you know we can survey literally a million stars at one time? And we have computers that they put down like an aperture, like a, a circle around every star on the image and count up all the photons in there and then does that for every frame. And then the computer um, makes a time series, like brightness as a function of time on the bottom and then looks for, the computer looks for a tiny drop in brightness that might be indicative of a planet. And one of the main telescopes we use is the, it's a NASA mission called TESS, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And TESS had monitor, it's in outer space, it's in space. It's on a very elliptical orbit around Earth. And TESS, um, if you think of the constellation Orion, you can see it behind me. TESS um, has four cameras, four like mini telescopes. And each telescope covers a field of view the size of Orion. And it covers four of those stacked together with a giant strip on the sky. And that data is downlinked to Earth every two weeks. And all the data is public actually. So if you are a more kind of advanced, I was gonna say amateur astronomer, but if you know how to use data and search for it, you can go on the public archive where not only all the test data is, but planet candidates are listed as well. So we have computers, we have techniques. This is the main way we find planets today. Now, what's really interesting about exoplanets and astronomers is the whole trend in the field is to go after smaller and smaller stars because it's easier to find planets around small stars than it is to find planets around larger stars like the size of our sun. So here I show you a real image of our sun. And can you see this little black Dot, that's a trend, fake transiting planet. And I've also plotted for you a fake picture of a star called TRAPPIST-1, a very, very small red dwarf star. Stars come in many different sizes. And in this case, I've copied over the same black dot showing you that the a, a small planet of the same size will take out a larger area on a small star than a large star. <laughs> In this case, the planet to star area ratio is one part in 100, which is a far bigger drop in brightness than an Earth-Sun pair, which would be one part in 10,000. So this whole field is pushing towards finding planets around smaller and smaller stars. And we have a lot of ways we're doing that. I just showed you two ground-based observatories that have a series of telescopes monitoring individual stars. And on the bottom left, I'm showing you the space mission I mentioned called TESS. Yeah, that's just an artist's conception of TESS in outer space. So I wanted to just talk a bit about planets transiting small stars. I wonder if any of you have heard of the TRAPPIST system. It's, um, you asked somebody, um, Sarah had asked about names. So a group of astronomers decided to search for transiting planets around the very smallest stars out there. And these stars are so small, any smaller and colder, they wouldn't be a star. They wouldn't be able to have the right pressures on the inside to make fusion to be a star. And on the right here, I'm showing you an image of Jupiter. And then the fake orange blob is the size that these cold, small red dwarf stars are, so tiny just a bit bigger than Jupiter. 
And our sun for scale is shown in the bottom corner. So the group called them, they called their telescope and their survey TRAPPIST. And they went out and they looked only at 20 stars as a pilot project. And they found an amazing system. And so they named the star TRAPPIST-1 because it hadn't had a name. It was so faint, no one had observed it before. And then the TRAPPIST planets got named TRAPPIST-1, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. And I'm showing you on the left the transits from the TRAPPIST system. It's an incredible system with seven planets, all transiting. On the bottom y-axis, it's showing you time from mid-transit in days. It's kind of an awkward unit. These transits last about one hour or an hour and a half each. On the left, it's showing you relative brightness. It's all normalized so that they're just um, put in a different place on the figure, so it's easy viewing for you. But what you can see is that each planet that is further from the star has a longer transit. Because of Kepler's third law, a planet further from the star takes longer to orbit, and therefore its transit will also be longer. I do teach an undergraduate class where we spend nearly a month on transiting planets. Here I'm only spending about three minutes on it, <laughs> but we would... Um, be able to unpack all the equations that describe transits, all the rich information embedded in these transit light curves. So let me, uh, let me take you on a virtual trip to a planet orbiting a red dwarf star, because these systems are very, very different from, from what, what things are like here on our own planet. First of all, depending on the star type, the star might be very big in the sky. And this is an artist's conception. So the artist wanted to imagine the sky that's not blue, but red. But in reality, we don't know what is in the planet atmosphere. We don't know what kind of clouds or hazes are there. And the artist is also showing you um, other planets in the same system. What's really interesting is that planets orbiting small stars in the habitable zone of their star, the zone around the star where the planet as heated from the star is not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. Those planets, um, they have to be pretty close to the star because the small stars give off a lot less energy than sun-sized stars. So the planet has to be quite close to the star. And by being that close over time, over tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years, the planet um, gets into a favorable energy state, the lowest energy state where it's what we call tidally locked. Just like the moon shows the same face to earth at all time, the planet becomes tidally locked. So it rotates one time for every time it orbits. That's pretty crazy. That's like one day is the same as one year on the planet. And what that also means is that if we could visit this planet, um, one side of the planet is always in day, one is always in night, always. So which part of the planet would you visit? Would you visit the planet where it's always day? Well, no, because if you're in SEDS, you like space and astronomy, so you would have to go where it's always night. And the stars would always be visible. What's interesting about these um, planets is the distance from the small red dwarf star, one year, the time it takes the planet to go around the star, it depends on how small and cold the star is for planets in the habitable zone, but a year could be a few days or as long as a month. So it's very, very different from our own planet. Now on a tidally locked planet, if we could visit it, the sun or the star, it would literally be in the same place in the sky at all times. Imagine a sun that never rises or sets. Yes, and once I gave this talk and someone in the audience got really angry with me because um, they said that wasn't 100% true. Did you know the moon? You know, we see the same face of the moon at all times. But did you know the moon librates? It has this kind of a little back and forth. So if you drew a map of the moon, you're seeing a little more than one hemisphere because sometimes the moon is just like a little bit rotated towards you a tiny bit. And sometimes it's rotated a tiny bit. So the sun would move around on the sky a little bit, but it certainly wouldn't rise or set. Now, perhaps visiting this planet or a planet like this actually would be a terrible idea because the stars give off flares, high energy flares. And we couldn't, I don't know about where you are, but here everyone's like glued to their phones at all times, you know, looking at news or social media or whatever. Uh-uh, because those high energy particles would destroy the electronics. And like, what kind of sunscreen would we bring? We'd probably worry about these high energy particles giving us some 
mutations and maybe cancer. So I told you that story because there's a lot of mixed feelings out there about all the time and energy going into finding small planets around small stars. They're the easiest thing for us to look for, but we're not sure if they are suitable places for life because of all that high energy radiation. So this star, do all stars release such a flare? Good question. That's, that's a really good question. And, I, and it, most stars do emit flares. Yes. So I don't know how many of you follow, um, how you know much you follow all the space news, but I think it was two or three nights ago, our sun gave off a flare and it gave off um, a, like a relatively large amount of energy. And they told us here where I live, I live in the Northern United States of America. They said we had a chance to see the Northern Lights. I actually forgot, can someone please put in the chat? I don't know what latitude um, Pakistan is at. Could you please just put it for me? Here we're at 42 degrees North. So I think anyone on earth who was around 40 degrees North latitude had a chance to see Northern Lights because our sun had given off a flare and it was coming towards earth. So if someone wants to just help me out, you can put up what um, latitude you are. So it turns out but that these small red dwarf stars, they have way more flares than stars like our sun, so much more. And it turns out that the Kepler Space Telescope was uh, monitoring the TRAPPIST-1 star along with tens of thousands of other stars for 80 days. And astronomers found that in those 80 days, TRAPPIST-1 gave off 40, four zero flares. That's like a flare every other day, basically. I mean, that's a lot of flares. And one of the flares was incredibly strong. They had to extrapolate from visible wavelengths to all wavelengths. And they said that one of the flares was so strong, it rivaled the Carrington event here on Earth. Here's a picture of our sun. This is, um, it looks kind of strange because it's taken at this special filter called H-alpha. And these images are taken by a special satellite that monitors our sun. So it's showing you our sun with a flare that's also doing having what we call a coronal mass ejection. Our sun is actually in the process of flaring, uh, giving off part of itself. And these flares are high energy particles that can, if they're going in the right direction, come towards Earth. Oh, wow, I was very ignorant. I didn't realize that you're only seven degrees north. <laughs> okay, so you're not gonna see the Northern Lights there. You already know that, you're too far south typically. Um, thank you for putting that in there. I have no idea how I didn't know that. I'll definitely um, remember that from now on. But so in the 1850s, there was a, a crazy event happened on Earth. At the time, um, an M, people didn't really understand magnetic fields. Maxwell's equations were not written down yet at that time. And an, astro an amateur astronomer named Carrington from Britain was looking at our sun and he saw sunspots and these sunspots uh, brightened a little bit. And one day and a half later, our earth became electrified. Part of our sun, like in this image, had come off our sun, came hurtling towards earth. And if you've taken electromagnetism, you'll know that magnetic fields can induce a current. But this small part of our sun had an embedded magnetic field which hit our earth's magnetic field. And then our whole earth just lit up. We the, the stories are of Northern lights reaching almost down to the equator. I wonder if the Carrington event in 1850 that people at eight degrees North latitude could see the Northern lights even. And we didn't have a power grid back then. People didn't have electricity in their homes, but um, the line, the um, grid, like the telegraph electrical wires caught on fire. So this is kind of bad news. If there's a planet that's receiving giant flares on a continual basis, it could be really rough for planets and life. So how can we get to know the extreme conditions of an exoplanet? It's really hard actually, because we don't know much about planets. We can study the stars and we can use, the, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope, and we can measure the ultraviolet um, radiation from a star, which is related to how active the stars are. We can study the brightness of stars, and if the brightness varies quite a lot, we know that the star has activity on it. So 
Not sure about these small red dwarf stars, but to answer this question, how will we find another Earth? We have this fast track by searching small stars for what we call Earth cousins instead of Earth twins. We'll use transits, the most favorable planet binding technique for small planets. So the next question, oh, I was gonna continue this question. When and how will we find another Earth part two? So it turns out that transits are only the first part of a long story because the planet star systems have to be like almost perfectly aligned so that the planet will go in front of the star as seen from Earth. What we'd really like to do is to use a different technique we call direct imaging. We'd like to have a way to block out the starlight so we can see the planet directly. That's kind of our overarching goal in exoplanets is not to have to rely on transiting planets because they're quite rare actually, but is to block out the starlight and see planets. Uh, so we have a question, could life evolve in between extreme conditions of tidally locked planets? Sure, why not? If you think about if one of these tidally locked planets has an ocean, for example, water is very protective from these high energy particles. Perhaps life could evolve at the bottom of the ocean or in an ocean. Life could evolve on the night side of the planet, but we, we don't have any reason to think life can't evolve there. But again, it's partly because we know so little. So what we honest, so I'm gonna now move into another planet finding technique that's a bit futuristic. And what we'd like to do is to block out the starlight to see a planet directly. I want you to imagine us putting a giant screen in space. If we were to put a circular screen in space, we actually wouldn't be blocking out the star completely. Instead of just having a blank image, we would have this image on the right because light can act like a wave and the wave can bend around the edges of a giant screen in space. And we would see ripples. Just like um, in this picture, it would be like throwing a pebble in a pond. You'll see ripples in the water and light can make those ripples as well. So our dream is to put up a very specially shaped screen. One like this image in the bottom left. And then what would happen is we could see an image like the one on the bottom right whereby the light diffracts around these crazy patterns on, on this star shade. It would be like throwing a pebble in the pond. And instead of having waves or ripples, the pond would be perfectly smooth. And all the ripples would be pushed to the outer edges. This idea was written about in the 1960s. And it's been revisited by engineers every decade since that time until today we finally think we can build Starshade. Here's an animation showing a telescope and the starshade launching together. The petals unfurl from a stowed position, and this truss expands, locking the petals into place. Starshade would be tens of meters in diameter, and it would have to formation fly at tens of thousands of kilometers from a space telescope. It would line up just so to block out the starlight so we could see a planet directly. Starshade's an amazing concept. We're working on that. It's one of, it has been one of my main projects to try to, we don't have enough money to launch Starshade, but we're working on it. There's a question about why is the Starshade the special shape? I'll let you watch that video while I describe it. So if we put a circular shape in space and block out a star that's a point source of light, we will not be actually blocking out the light because light can diffract. It can bend around the edges of the starshade. And light actually creates ripples in light. So a circular screen won't work because of the wave nature of light. We need to have a very special shape. Like one way to describe it is like interference. When you have a circular shaped screen, the light constructively interferes with itself. So if we put a circular shaped screen in space, the image in our telescope will be this image on the right. Do you see the ripple pattern? There are these concentric rings of light because light acts like a wave and 
ends around the outside of the, of the starshade. So astronomers worked out with very complicated math, what is the perfect shape? So that when the light bends around it, it constructively interferes with itself in order to, it, constructive, it um, constructively interferes to get rid of the light. You know, like if you send a wave along a um, rope and you have two people sending the wave along a rope in the opposite phase, then the wave will cancel out. It's like that. Starshade's real. I wanted to show you some real hardware for Starshade. These petals are enormous. This petal is a prototype that's, I want to say it's about five and a half meters long. And it has this very special shape that's been mathematically derived. That's myself and two team members out at a NASA center in California. Here's a picture in the laboratory at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab showing one of the engineers who's working on small scale models of starshade to figure out how starshade would stow and deploy. So how will we find another earth part two? If we want to find an earth around a sun-like star, we have to go to space above the blurring effects of earth's atmosphere. And we would find it by a sophisticated new kind of space tool called a starshade. Can we go there? This is the question I get asked most often by, honestly, scientists, people of all walks of life want to know, can we go there? So I'm going to go and ask, answer a couple of other questions before I get there. Uh, actually, I'm going to come to the other questions back at the end of my talk. Okay. Um, I don't know. I love to just ask, I just have a couple of questions for you. If this were the size of our sun, how big would Earth be? Well, did you know Earth is about the size of a sunspot? So our Earth would be about the size of the sunspot on the sun. Then I'd like to ask you how far away would Earth be? If this is our sun to scale, how far away would our Earth be? Would it be in the room you're in now? Would it be down the street? Think about that for a moment. Um, there's like a little trick you can use because it turns out that our earth is just sort of crazily, it's approximately a hundred sun diameters away from the sun. So you can take the diameter of that sun and count a hundred times. And then in your head, you can see where earth would be. So it's probably not in the same room you're in, but maybe just maybe outside in the hallway somewhere. And then, um, I always like to ask too, if this is the size of our sun, how far away would the nearest star be? Given my, um, I already showed how ignorant I was of geography of what latitude Pakistan was at, so I can't answer that question for you, but I could leave it for you to figure out an answer. It's usually very far. Like it wouldn't be here in North America, but it could be somewhere in Europe, for example. But I just wanted you to think like how far apart the stars are from each other. They're incredibly far apart. And if you did the calculation, taking, for example, the Voyager 1 spacecraft and how fast it's traveling today, you know Voyager 1 is traveling at like 20 kilometers per second. And even at those very fast speeds, it would still take tens of thousands of years to reach to the nearest star. So, you know, when we think about can we travel to another star, like the answer is not for now. I think you probably already knew that answer. But one of the things about exoplanets is that there's a phrase, I'm going to try to explain it to you, but it's the line between what is mainstream science and what science and engineering is completely crazy. That line is constantly shifting. So instead of just saying, no, we cannot travel to a nearby star system, instead we should say, maybe, maybe there's a way. There's a question, can we travel by warp drive? There is no warp drive. It doesn't exist. So if you can invent warp drive, sure. But for now, no. So it turns out that there is a group out there trying to develop technology to get to the nearest star system. Now, that wouldn't be us humans going. We wouldn't be traveling to the nearest 
near a star system, but instead thousands of tiny spacecraft they want to call space chips would be designed. And these space chips would um, have a solar sail on them, a sail. One second. There's like a cartoon in the bottom right showing you a solar sail that would be about a few meters in diameter. So these little tiny satellites would be launched to low Earth orbit, they would deploy a sail. And then a bank of lasers on the ground would accelerate the sails to a 20th of the speed of light so that these sails with their spaceships, it's not spaceship, it's space chip would be able to accelerate to a 20th the speed of light. And they would take about 20 years to get to our nearest star, Alpha Centauri. Now this is a very hard problem, very hard. And the team that's working on it wrote down their 19 challenges. One challenge is these lasers here would have to be 100 gigawatts in power. So if you have a light bulb that's 100 watts, that's like, 100 watts and they need, um, what did I say here, 100 gigawatts of power. So they need like a billion light bulbs kind of, that's a lot of a lot of power. And someone has to be able to sell them land like two kilometers square to put all these telescopes. And think of the destructive power of those lasers shooting up in the sky and what they might do to any passing aircraft. That's a challenge. Another challenge is how do they accelerate the sail without literally evaporating all the material with all that power of lasers. And these lasers, by the way, they're using um, radiation pressure because photons can actually exert pressure and that's how it would work. Now these sails have no way to slow down. So they'd be going, traveling at 20% the speed of light, zooming by Alpha Centauri system and taking pictures of whatever's there and then sending those um, images back to Earth. I wanted just to tell you this because when we think about can we go there, the answer is maybe, actually. And that line between what is mainstream and crazy is shifting now because of all this work. Um, so yes, so that's where we're at. And so for the last part of my talk, that I will answer my last question I get, which is the follow-up question. So if I've carefully answered this question, if we can we go there and the answer is no, then the question is, well, why look? Well, I don't know how many of you watch this really old school um, Star Trek or the next generation or any version, but I like to say science fiction got some things wrong because they, in all the science fiction movies, you have to go to the planet. And here Spock had to travel at incredible speeds in Starship Enterprise to get to a planet this is a really, you should watch this show because it was made a long time ago and there weren't any like fancy graphics or animations, but they still visit all these planets and look for life forms. But we don't do that. Of course, we can't go anywhere. We use the telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope and others. And we observe planets from, from far away and study their atmospheres. There's other telescopes being built now the giant Magellan Telescope and others. And this is just a picture, an artist's conception. And look, you can see a truck here and you can see how huge this is, 20 meters in diameter. So what we're gonna do with, um, what we do is we try to look at, our goal is to look uh, at spectra. Here I'm showing you a rainbow, Hope, um, assuming you've all seen a rainbow. And if you can look at a rainbow very closely, you'll see lines missing. And these lines are, absorption in the planet atmosphere or the star atmosphere. And each one of these lines corresponds to an atom or molecule. So our goal eventually is to be able to look at spectra because Earth and Venus are about the same size and mass, but one planet has life and the other is completely inhospitable to life. Our whole goal is to identify gases that might be produced by life. Like here on Earth, we have oxygen that fills our atmosphere to 20% by volume. But without life on our planet, without photosynthetic bacteria or plants, we would have no oxygen in our atmosphere. So if there's a planet, if there's an intelligent civilization orbiting a planet around a nearby star with the kind of telescopes like Starshade, and they're looking back at our planet Earth and they see oxygen, 
they'll be highly suspicious that something's going on there, that perhaps there is um, life on our planet making oxygen, which is such a highly reactive gas. It shouldn't be on, on here at all. Now, I want to wrap up my talk so we have some time for questions. I did have some other slides, which I'm, I can go back to if needed. Um, but I just want you to know that we can observe atmospheres of about 100 exoplanets right now. But these atmospheres are big, hot, giant planets. We're not able to study small, rocky planets like Earth right at the moment. But our goal is to do that and to look for water vapor and signs of life and to try to understand if there might be some kind of bacteria on other worlds. I'm going to skip through all this, but I'd be happy to come back and answer some questions after. So to summarize, what is an exoplanet? It's a planet that orbits a star other than the sun. How will we find another Earth? That's my main takeaway for you. We have this so-called fast track to look at um, planets transiting small stars. Can we go there? Not for now. <laughs> if we can't go there, why look? Because we can use Hubble and other telescopes to search for, to study atmospheres and to search for planets that may be habitable. Thank you so much for your attention today. I'd like to return to answering some of the questions here. And I'm not sure how much time you have. I still have more time. Um, but let me go through some of these. Okay, so there's, okay, let's see. Let me think of where to, how to start answering these. Um, talking about these tidally locked planets, there's a question saying, could life exist at the boundary on day and night? Sure, it can. But you know, here on Earth, we have life that's nocturnal. So there's no reason that light couldn't be on the night side or the day side. It doesn't have to necessarily be at the boundary. Is there any solar flare protection system for important electrical equipment? You know, not necessarily. You know, for our own, I don't know if you, um, so in the 1980s, our sun gave off a pretty big flare and it destroyed some satellites because it destroyed their electronics. So there is something called radiation hardening. And there are components that are built to withstand radiation, but it's still a pretty big problem. Um, there's a question about, is there a way the public can work on exoplanets? There's one way actually, and it is, if you Google on planethunters.org, it will eventually take you to a place where you can look for transits. People are taking the data from tests and they're making it for crowdsourcing and it trains you how to look by eye and try to find planets. And so I really encourage you to do that. And they actually make discoveries that the professionals missed. So um, do we think Mars will be habitable in the near future? Uh, maybe, you know, I love the idea of terraforming Mars. The thought is that at Mars, there's a lot of carbon dioxide frozen and a lot of frozen water at the poles. And if we could melt that, then the atmosphere would be filled with greenhouse gases that would self-heat the planet. But I think that whole process takes a few decades. So first we have to figure out how to get to Mars, land on Mars, and then somehow the energy required to melt all of that ice and then take a few decades, so someday. Um, What if there's a planet that's habitable, but not for us, but for another species, and they could get energy another way? They could actually. And here on Earth, there's plenty of life that doesn't use photosynthesis. There's some life that lives beneath the ocean at deep sea hydrothermal vents, and they use chemical energy to get energy. So there are certainly a lot of other ways. And we do spend a lot of time wondering what gases other than oxygen might be a sign of life. Are there any other questions that I haven't answered yet? I'm actually going to, I just want to put a couple of things in the chat. So I have to stop sharing my screen so I can um, put a couple of things in the chat for you. I'm 
I'm going to send you the link for Eyes on Exoplanets. It takes a while to download, and you do need a decent amount of um, space. So there's Eyes on Exoplanets. I'm going to look up planethunters.org because it's called something different now. Here it is. This is how to. Um, what is the most common method for exoplanets? It's transits, the transit technique. I didn't have time to talk about the others. There's about six different ways to, to find planets. Um, let's see, I don't know the current status of Pioneer 10, 11, Voyager 1 and 2, but are any, I don't know if, I, are any of you on Twitter? You know, the funny thing is you can follow Voyager on Twitter and it sends you like an automatic message every week or so about the status. So I think the Voyagers one and two are both have left our solar system and they both have about one instrument that still works and they still take data. Okay, I think I, um, Isuri, how much time do we have today? Time till 8.30 actually. We have one more hour if you'd like to ask some more questions. How much more time? Because I, I don't, um, till 8.30, which is? Yeah, ma'am, we can go up until 8.30, so we have like one more. One more. One more? Okay, I'll answer this question about phosphine on Venus. So I was part of a team that found phosphine on Venus. This is a huge discovery because phosphine shouldn't be on Venus. Now, some people are claiming it's a false alarm. So it turns out, by the way, that a mission that went to Venus in the 1980s called Pioneer Venus also found signs of phosphine. So the debate is still going on right now. And we're not, I wouldn't, I'd say that the team I'm a part of still thinks we found phosphine. Other people are pretty sure we did not find phosphine. So you'll have to wait. We can't answer whether it's a false alarm or whether it's real, but I still believe phosphine is real. How to become an astrophysicist? Well, take physics classes, take math classes, learn how to computer program. That's the, probably the most important thing is learning how to program. Go on planethunters.org and try to learn everything you can. That would be the start of that path. How did I achieve all my amazing stuff? Well, a lot of hard work and a lot of careful thinking. Well, um, these are excellent questions. And you know, you may, and I don't know the answer to all of these. How can Artemis Project protect astronauts? I mean, you can, certain materials are resistant to radiation. So have you seen the movie, The Martian or read the book? Because on that movie, they're traveling towards Mars and our sun emits a giant flare. And on that spaceship going to Mars, they have a special room, like a special part of it that has very, very thick walls that are radiation protected. So in some cases, um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how those astronauts will be protected, but presumably their spacesuits will have some kind of special protection. If you, I mean, you're always welcome to contact me, but unfortunately I receive so many messages from people all around the world and I don't really always have time to respond. So please don't take it personally if you write to me and I, I don't respond to you. Mm. Professor, is it okay if I read out some questions we got? Sure, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, there was this question that there was, um how uh, how can the habitual zone of a star of a hot star be identified? Well, there's a pretty straightforward definition. Essentially, we calculate the temperature that an object would be if it's heated by the star. 
So something that's very close to the star will be very hot. And as a planet, you imagine a planet further from the star, it will be very cold. However, there actually is no good way to make a very specific calculation because it all depends on the planet atmosphere. As you know, here on Earth, we have a greenhouse effect. And you know how we're worried about our climate warming just by um, small amounts of extra carbon dioxide. Like we have 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. But imagine a planet that has like 800 parts per million carbon dioxide or has 10% of its atmosphere carbon dioxide. That planet would be so much hotter. So the habitable in itself, although it's purely defined by the temperature a planet is as it's heated by the star, there's really much more complexity in the atmosphere. There's some questions about foreign students at MIT internships. It's um, at the undergraduate level, there's unfortunately very few international students. You're always welcome to apply to MIT, to go to MIT, but there are not very many international students. Are there any programs for foreign students? Um, most of the programs, unfortunately, are geared towards US students. I'm gonna to try to explain the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone one more time. It's the story for little kids about Goldilocks, you know, who goes to this house of bears and tries the bed and tries other stuff and finds the porridge that's not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. So we call the Goldilocks zone, the zone around the star, where as heated by the star, the planet is not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. I'm gonna see if I can find a picture for you. Not, uh, let's see. I don't have a picture for you, but the Goldilocks, it's all just based on temperature and how far the planet is from the star. How old was I when I realized this is who I want to be? Well, I was 16 years old because I didn't know you could be an astronomer for a job. I didn't belong to SEDS or anything like that. And I went to an open house at the university near my home, which was trying to advertise to recruit students. And that, wow, I was just amazed that I met professors and graduate students. And the funny part of the story I'd like to share with you is that I went home and I told my dad, I was like, wow, dad, I can be an astronomer for a job. And he got angry with me, very angry. He said, no, I could not be an astronomer because he wanted me to be able to get a job and get paid well. And he told me, Sarah, you have to get a job and support yourself. And he was practically screaming at me and not rely on any man. Because my dad had two sisters and one of them married, this is really bad, okay, but one married a wealthy man who became quite wealthy. And the other sister married a alcoholic, abusive man. He was really mean. So when his sister, that sister was in her early 20s, she had to divorce her husband, but she had no job, no education, no skills. And she had two little kids. I see a kid there who's really cute, but these children were like two kids under the age of three years old and she had no way to support herself. So guess who had to pay money to support her? My dad had to. <laughs> so he didn't want to see me end up like that sister that whoever I married would, would make or break my life. So he said I couldn't be an astronomer. It doesn't sound related, but it is because he wanted me to be able to get a job and make money and that it didn't matter um, if my husband turned out to be like not that great of a guy, I could still pay for myself and my kids. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, I had to do whatever my dad said because I loved him. And so I went to university and I studied pre-med because he thought I should be a doctor since at least doctors make a lot of money. And just to tell you a little bit more about the story. Um, yeah, anyway, he wanted me to be a dermatologist. That's people with skin doctor because they work part-time. I could work part-time 
and stuff. Anyway, so at the end of the day, I went to university, but I loved astronomy so much that I just got a summer job in astronomy. And then I was able to go to graduate school where in North America, in graduate school, you get paid money, a small amount of money. And so then I could support myself and everything. And eventually I became a professor right before he died. And he was, I think, finally understood that I could have a job. And he was really happy that he knew I'd be able to support myself even after he was no longer with us. Okay, here's a good question. Transit method is the most popular and effective, but when we compare other methods um, with transit method, do they give better info on a planet? Well, not necessarily because every method gives us something different actually. So the transit method gives us planet size and there's other methods that give us planet mass. So it is the most popular one now, but 10 years from now, it might not be. Can I explain hydrothermal vents? I can try. Deep in the ocean, there are vents. Like you might think of them almost like miniature volcanoes, but they're at the bottom of the ocean. And they emit like gases and material and they're incredibly hot. They're like hundreds of degrees Kelvin. So they're literally just like a miniature volcano giving off um, energy and gases. And there are these, um, uh, there's a big submersible. People have gone down to the bottom of the ocean in like this giant ball. I think it's pretty scary personally. And they have found all sorts of life forms right at the bottom of the ocean that get energy um, from these hydrothermal vents. Uh, if no, okay. What is the meaning of life? I do definitely have no mean. I have no answer for the meaning of life, unfortunately. Um, sometimes, as a scientist, it's kind of harsh, but I think there is no meaning. I struggle to find meaning. I hope all of you have a have a better answer than that. So Professor, that's the other question we have been asked. Um, can you hear me, Professor? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so the question goes, if the plane of the planetary system is vertical to our system, uh, then the method, I think the transit method, will not work. So what other methods can be used for that kind of systems? Well, the method that we can use is direct imaging, where we block out the starlight and see planets directly. We can't really do that yet, as I've explained, for solar system-like planets, but that would be one method we can use. When the sun turns into a red giant, could life arise on outer planets? That's a very great question. Thank you for that question. I like to think the answer would be yes. And for a bit of background for those who don't know, that when our sun exhausts its fuel, its hydrogen and helium, our sun will turn into a red giant star and it will expand. And five billion years from now, this red giant star will engulf Earth and it will destroy our planet. But some of these outer planets, not the planets themselves perhaps, because the planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they are what we call they're, they're mostly hydrogen and helium and they have no solid surface as we know it, but they have moons. And so hopefully life could arise on some of the moons of the outer planets. Yes, I wrote this equation called the Seeger equation. And this equation, I'm, um, kind of copied the Drake equation, where the Drake equation is an illustrative equation. The goal is to, I'm going to actually put a link here so you can take a look at it. Um, the goal is to illustrate our chance of finding life on another planet. And the Drake equation is for radio signals. It's the hope that there's intelligent aliens out there who 
have radio telescopes and create a message to send to us here on Earth. Well, I took that same idea and I rewrote this Drake equation to try to explain how we could um, think about finding life on a on an um, exoplanet. And the Drake equation, or the Seeger equation rather, has several turns of it terms that are supposed to help us think through whether or not we have, uh, whether or not we can find life somewhere else. It's a little complicated just to explain um, in words, but if you take some time later on to look through that link, you can explore more about it. Does our sun have enough matter to turn into a black hole? It does not actually. We don't think our sun can ever become a black hole. Are we alone in the universe? You know, I think we are not because there are so many stars out there. Our own Milky Way galaxy has probably a few hundred million stars. And we think there are hundreds of millions of galaxies. So how many is that all together? That is so many stars. A hundred million times a hundred million. So I really think there has to be life out there somewhere on a planet somewhere far away. But remember, we can only study planets in our corner of the galaxy. So it could be really hard. Is there any combination between exoplanet and parallel world concepts? Um, not yet, no. <laughs> so what are my views on the potential nine planet? Could it exist, why? You know, people love the idea of planet nine or another planet in our solar system. And just for those of you who don't know, a number of years ago, astronomers predicted that there was the planet nine because there are objects called dwarf planets beyond Pluto that have very elliptical orbits that are all aligned in a curious way that indicates there's another planet out there that's uh, forcing the planets, all these dwarf planets to all be in specific orbits. But if there is a ninth planet, astronomers should, um, might, uh, should see it sometime. And we have very detailed images of almost every part of our night sky taken with very sensitive instruments, very sophisticated telescopes, and they haven't seen it yet. So I hope planet nine is out there. It could exist, but we really need evidence to see the planet it, itself actually. What exactly is the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud? Well, we think when our solar system formed, it was a very violent place that there were lots of planets and these planets, um, too many planets. And the planets interacted with the material around them and they sent all the little things, planetesimals and little things that became comets, uh, they like ejected them from the system and that they ended up forming a big cloud around our solar system. And this Oort cloud, it's called, named after the person who discovered it, Oort. And we think it's a source of comets today, but there's disturbances in the cloud and the comets get sent our way. Though Europa and Titan are not in the habitable zone, could there exist life? We think there could. And that's a good question because it shows that the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone, it's a kind of very limited concept. Europa has an ice shell, but underneath that ice, we think there's liquid water and there could well be life on Europa. Titan is one of Saturn's moons that has um, liquid on it. It's an incredible concept that Titan has liquid lakes, but they're not water. They're made of what's essentially gasoline. It has liquid methane and ethane lakes. And life needs liquid. And we like to think that there could be life swimming around in Titan's lakes. There's a good question. Can habitable zones shift? Yes, they can, because stars evolve with time and they slowly kind of get a bit bigger, a bit hotter, especially these small red dwarf stars I, I didn't mention, but they take a very long time to become stable stars. 
it's like having a very long teenage phase. These stars take a long time and they, they change with time. So yes, habitable zones can shift. What's a brown dwarf? A brown dwarf is a failed star. It's, a, it's an object that collapsed out of a cloud and it didn't quite have the right temperatures on the inside, temperature and pressure to fuse hydrogen. But we think brown dwarfs have fused a little bit of deuterium, but they just didn't have enough to ignite on the inside. Don't think there's possible, what do I think about time traveling? Is there any possibility? I don't think there's any possibility for time travel. But that said, time travel is one of my favorite science fiction ideas. And so I read a lot of fiction that, I love um, science fiction stories that involve time travel. Warp drive, is warp drive possible now? Warp drive is definitely not possible. Though Earth is carbon-based, can silicon-based life evolve? You know, we actually don't think that silicon life can exist, actually. We don't think silicon is, that it has, um, we don't think sil pure silicon-based life can be a thing. It's just there's not enough flexibility in the molecular structures that are made with silicon only to, or dominantly silicon. How many exoplanets are found using the astrometric method up to now? No planets have been purely discovered by astrometry until now. Some planets have been detected. They've been discovered by another planet finding technique and they've been detected by astro astrometry later. And I wanna say it's like a few on the order of a few. Could Jupiter become a baby star in the future? No, uh, Jupiter is not massive enough. It cannot become a star in the future. How did astronomers come up with a theory of formation in the solar system? Mm -hmm, that's a good question. I think the first theory might have been in the 1600s. I don't have a good, good answer to that. Here's a question. What about Einstein's twin paradox theory? Is it similar to time traveling theories? Like yes and no, because in Einstein's twin paradox theory, it only goes one way. You know, you can't reverse time travel. You can just change the difference in time between two, two people. Okay, here's a good question. If our habitable zone may shift, then eventually Earth might be too hot to be habitable, but Mars might become suitable for life. That's true, actually. That is a good point. But you know, as our star becomes a giant, a giant, there might not quite be enough time for Mars to become habitable before Mars is also engulfed by our sun as it's becoming a bigger and bigger giant star. What happened in the end of the universe or what will happen? I uh, don't know. <laughs> we don't know yet what will happen. What's my idea in moon colonization? I think Mars is a way better place to colonize. I think as far as our moon, we don't have a way to engineer the moon to make it a planet that could be self-sustaining for life. As if I could interrupt you for a second, I have a small announcement to make. Uh, so we have some uh, viewers are watching through YouTube. So if you guys have any questions, you can post it in your comment section and we can read it out to Professor Seeger. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And, um, and there's another question. Uh, so some of our audience wants to know whether there's any way that we can join like this research that's happening. Any way we can take any part in it. Well, the best suggestion I have for you is the link I posted for you already. I don't know if the YouTube viewers can see the chat, but if you Google planethunters.org, I encourage you to do that and to get involved with crowdsourcing for finding planets that way. Okay. 
Where did life come from? Could you explain the theory of panspermia? Well, we scientists haven't figured out exactly how life originates, but there's plenty of good ideas of how life can originate here on Earth. The best guess is that life originated in little pools, little pools of water um, on Earth's surface, and that as little pools, like tiny, tiny ponds, that um, ingredients for life were all there, complex molecules. And as these ponds could evaporated, the ingredients got concentrated. And then it would rain again, or you'd come to another season with groundwater, and they'd be dilute again. And so molecules could break apart and reform, get concentrated by evaporation. And we think that's how life on Earth ultimately originated. The theory of panspermia is that life originated somewhere else, and that some life trapped in a meteorite got sent towards Earth, just ejected from another planet, or maybe even from another solar system came to Earth, landed on Earth, and brought life here from afar. But we don't really need that theory. And that theory itself is complicated because life still has to have a way to originate somewhere else. Can a wormhole exist? It'll make traveling through space easy, right? <laughs> so wormholes can theoretically exist, but it would not be easy because these wormholes would be incredibly gravitationally powerful. And if there was a wormhole we could get to, which there isn't, we would be destroyed well before we reached the horizon of that wormhole because the gravitational forces would be so powerful, they would just rip us apart. What do I think about SpaceX? I think SpaceX is doing a tremendously amazing job. They're reusing rockets. They're making space cheaper to get to than it was before. Does the universe expand? Yes, the universe is expanding and it is accelerating and it expand. It is. The universe is expanding for how long will it happen? Well, I don't have a great answer to that. What is beyond the expanding universe? Now we're leaving astronomy. We have no idea what it's what our universe is expanding into. You all had really great questions and so many questions, very broad. Good job, everybody. Any news on the Mars One mission? I think the Mars, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think the Mars One mission was canceled. I'm just gonna check that so I can. Yes, in February, I'm just reading off my phone for you. In February, 2019, it was reported that Mars One had declared bankruptcy and was permanently dissolved as a company. So Mars One mission was an admirable idea, but they just didn't have the ability to make it work. What's orbital resonance? Okay, you know, I don't know if you this analogy works for you, but there's this idea when you push a child on the swing and then, you know, when the whole structure starts shaking in a certain way, that an orbital resonance is when planets, one planet orbits the star in a period, and that the outer planet orbits um, in an integer period for the ratio, integer ratio. So it's like as if you had one planet that took 20 days to go around the star, and the outer planet took 40, four zero days to go around the star. We call that an orbital resonance. It means the planets would line up um, every few orbits, they would line up, and they would give each other a little gravitational push. So that's what an orbital resonance is. The Clipper mission, um, there's this mission called the Europa Clipper mission. And it is a mission that is supposed to go to um, Europa. Europa is one of Jupiter's icy moons and it will orbit the moon and kind of examine the surface and things like that. Do exoplanets have ring systems? They should, There's, they may have ring systems, but we're not able to detect it right now. Um, Isiri has a lot of great questions and they're, you're very well read. Just like in the book, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, 
Will we be able to build a machine to calculate the answer to life, universe, and everything? Maybe someday. <laughs> So I think that's all the questions we have for Professor Seeker today. Madam, thank you so much for taking so much time to like, let us know about exopanels and to answer all our questions. So Isri, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Nitin. And so we've reached the end of our session today. It was an amazing session. I'm sure everyone learned a lot. So, uh, Professor Sega, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for answering my absurd questions here and there. And it's a good for Sri Lanka to have you here with us today. I'm not sure whether you know, but you inspire a lot of women and a lot of students around the world. I personally love watching your interview with Lex Friedman. I just love listening to how you fell in love with stars when you were a kid. And um, thank you so much for accepting our invitation once again. So on behalf of said Sri Lanka and said Scania, I wish you an amazing future, all the best. And we are looking forward to seeing you more in the future. And if time permits, please do visit us. We'd love to have you here with us today. Thank you. And to our amazing audience today, you were great. Thank you for asking all these amazing questions. We had a supportive bunch of audience today. I hope everyone learned lots of things. So have a great weekend, everyone. And stay tuned with us for more interesting projects. Have a great evening. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye, bye ma'am. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much.